Wow. <laughs> nice. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Alexander Pascal, and joining me today are Brian Karras, Jordan Walker. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new filmic tone mapper in just a minute. But first, it's the news. Clint, the thing. There you go. <laughs> All right. So first up, we actually have a series of videos that have been put up since GDC, and I just want to go over them really quick. Uh, we have Exploring the Technology that Drives the Human Race. Now, if you saw our keynote uh, at GDC, you will know that we had Kim LeBerry up on stage with a bunch of other people um, to talk about the Mills Blackbird. Now, uh, you can see just from this image, it was we basically had a car driving around a lot of different places, and in real time, they actually showed uh, renderings of other vehicles on top of it. It's really fascinating, but if you want to see the behind the scenes, um, check this talk out. This is over on unrealengine.com slash blog. Uh, these are just all on the main page, so it should be pretty easy to find. Uh, or if you're watching this on the YouTube archive, it'll be listed uh, down below. All right. Uh, next up in this list uh, is the UE4 Animations and Physics uh, Technical Showcase. Again, a really exciting uh, tutorial, or uh, I guess a, a kind of behind the scenes look um, at how we actually created a lot of this tech, how the tech works on the back end. Um, this one's very impressive for anyone who's into animation or physics, so please come and check this one out as well. Um, and then finally out of this uh, list of videos is the content-driven multipass rendering, which is basically, um, it's, it's a lot of uh, Ryan Brooks being in front of the camera in a Hawaiian t-shirt talking about caustics and uh, light refraction and, and all these other things that are well above my head. But if you are into rendering and you want to see the wizard himself doing some really in, in very entertaining things, uh, check this one out. It's... Um, it's very math heavy uh, and very informative, so uh, great work on that one. Uh, and then last bit of news from the Unreal Engine side of things is to not forget the Spring UE4 Jam is coming up. Oh my gosh, it's been uh, a while now since we've had a la uh, previous jam. Um, just want to let everyone know to let their friends know to go ahead and sign up, send me your info, tell me how many team members you want in your team, and tell me your team's name, and I will go ahead and start adding you into our list of participating teams. Uh, we have a ton of awesome sponsors, and we're actually getting new uh, actual additional sponsors as well. Just to run through them again really quickly, uh, we have Intel, uh, Houdini, Panda Studios, and of course Assembla also I will have a couple more joining us um, pretty shortly on this list, just uh, finalizing some details. Uh, but thank you all so much for uh, sponsoring us and providing us with all kinds of crazy prizes. If you are interested in doing a, a jam where you might be able to win some really awesome tech prizes, come down to the forums.unrealengine.com and then go to the event section. It's stickied at the top for Spring UE4 Jam and send me your info. All right, that's what I got from the news today. Uh, the second thing we got is, of course, Community Spotlight. All righty. Community Spotlight, uh, we always start this one off by going to answers.unrealengine.com and showing off all of the people who have this week's top karma. Uh, this is a high scoreboard for people who come out on an to answers and actually answer each other's questions. Um, comment with more information and, and try to help each other out by getting correct answers and having someone you know approve your answer you get points or by getting upvotes you also get points so um just a few shout outs here uh, oh by the way uh, if you are on the top three of this you get a forum badge and if you are on this list uh, top three three times you get a forum badge with a special gold star to let everyone know how helpful and awesome you are so um mosley uh, excellent work, thank you so much. Uh, Extra Life Matt, thank you. I think that you're a new name for me, unless I'm mistaken. Black Phoenix, you're back up on top, uh, good for you. Um, Project Geist, very close. Uh, not quite, though, for the badge, but thank you for getting up on the list. Um, Minge Piss, Pish, Passion? Uh, I think uh, last time I get I went with Mango Passion uh, as your name because you have no vowels in your name and I can't pronounce that. Uh, thank you for coming up here. Shadow River, you're on here all the time. I'm going to, seriously, I always joke about giving you a Shadow River badge, but we, we're just going to have to do that at this point. Um, I'm going to pronounce your name Judge uh, or, or Jug. Uh, thank you, Jug. <laughs> Good work. Uh, on getting on the list. Um, Steph M, thank you also. And uh, Eritreal, Eritreal, Eritreal maybe. I've seen some people do it like that. Um, Eritreal, Eritreal, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I don't know how to pronounce this one, it's a little complicated. All right, Simple 2012, good work too, buddy. Um, 
All right. Uh, whoa, no! Right, right <laughs> I just totally uh, exited right, out of that. Right click the tab. Yep, yep. Uh, Reopen, close tab. Uh, thank you so much. I am. Did not mean to. <laughs> that went so fast, and then it fried my brain. Forgot how to re <laughs> repick a tab. Um, yes, so first up in our community spotlight items, uh, Polygon Jelly has sent me over some really neat uh, train and rail system that he's been working on. Um, Polygon Jelly's got uh, a few great screenshots explaining how it all functions. It's a track and rail system. Uh, it's still not finished, but they're looking for feedback and suggestions and ideas. If you come over to the forums, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Uh, it's under marketplace uh, submissions for train and rail system, but it's still being, uh, they still want more info, more feedback and, um, and all that. But please come and check out what all they're doing. And uh, they also have a simple website right now for showing it off. But um, that one was brought up to me. And if you out there are working on any kind of projects uh, or if you have any kind of dev blogs you want to show off, tutorials you want to show off, please send them over to me via Twitter or forums or however you can get a hold of me. I want to show off the things you've been working on out there in the community. So um, thank you, Polygon Jelly, for sending me this over. It's a really fun little system. Um, next up, gameplay abilities in U. Uh, we don't have official gameplay abilities documentation uh, and tutorials out yet because it's still very experimental and still very uh, early. A lot of this stuff is likely to change, but if you're in 4.15 and you want to try playing around with it, uh, gameplay abilities are available. Uh, you just have to enable them, and the full instructions on how to get all that done is in here. Um, now, this one was created by someone who didn't make the original post, but uh, the original post was made by uh, KZJ on the forums, and then someone actually translated into um, uh, actual information here that's a little bit more cleaned up, and uh, maybe they signed a signature at the bottom. Uh, oh, yeah, here we go. Yes, from KZJ and uh, J2645. Thank you so much uh, for translating this over. Um, but yeah, very helpful if you want to get started. Now, like I said, uh, as we update new versions of the engine, a lot of this is likely going to change, um, but the core concepts of how it functions are all in there. So thank you for, for doing that, you two guys. Um, really cool. Uh, and last thing on our spotlight items, um, Fernando Castillo sent me this uh, about a month ago, um, and I just hadn't had a chance to show it off, but he's working on some really interesting locomotion systems based on what Laurent showed on a previous stream about paragons and um, yeah, animation blending and movement, etc. cetera. Uh, they're fascinating little study if you want to come check him out. He's uh, at Nan2CC uh, on Twitter. He's also got a couple other YouTube videos that I'll um, have links up to uh, probably on the archive as well, but they're basically these little videos here. Um, they're really fascinating. You see how he's getting lean in there. Um, and I just thought they were really cool, really worth showing off uh, how the tech works. And yeah, you can see right behind how everything works. So again, good work for uh, to him. And thank you for taking what Laurent said and going and like, you know, running with it. If you also out there have done something based on what we've taught you here on a live stream, then I would love to hear about it and possibly show it off. Uh, and that is what I have for our community spotlights. And so that brings us to phew, Filmic Tone Mapper. And uh, I believe you have a presentation here. Yeah, Brian, yeah So I'm going to let you slides. bring that one up. Now, um, for those of you at home that might not be aware, we are in 4.15 uh, build of the engine. And uh, in 4.15, they've introduced some upda uh, sorry, updates to the defaults of... Um, Sorry, post-process to make it uh, more ACES compliant. What, what does that all mean exactly? Uh, I'm not 100% on it. So yeah, we've we changed what the default tone mapper is. Uh, this is something that's been in the engine actually for probably two years now. Mm -hmm. um, we we used it back on the Paragon uh, Watch trailer had it, but that work was actually done like right after Kite. So mm -hmm. yeah. it was long ago. Mm -hmm. It's been in the engine for a while, but it's been um, disabled by default. Uh, the only way to enable it was to change a CVAR. So it's been there, but for the most part, people haven't been using it outside of this building. Oh, um, but pretty much everything that we have done since then has all been using this tone mapper. So the Paragon launch trailer, um, the Hellblade demo that we did last year, um, the 
uh, the mill demo that we did this year, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Paragon's release. Yep, all the um, trailers for Paragon. So this is a long time coming yeah. then. It's, so it's so yeah, we, we've been using for it for, for a couple mm -hmm. of years now. Um, but in 4.15, we decided to uh, change that to be a default. Uh, really sh probably should have done that a while ago. <laughs> um, but there, w there was some um, some conflicts there with how things were going to work on mobile that we wanted to keep the same. But uh, we haven't really resolved all of that yet. But we thought it was silly to keep on going, moving forward without changing it to what we have been using for so long and have been getting great results with. Um, but going into a bit of theory behind how this stuff works, why it works the way that it does, um, I'll, I'll touch on a bit of just uh, talking about how light works. <laughs> <laughs> Throw my shoe at you. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, this is the, the electromagnetic um, light spectrum of the amount of light that we can see. There's only a tiny slice of that um, called the visible light spectrum. goes from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers as far as their wavelength. Um, things that are above that are infrared. Um, things that are below that are ultraviolet as well as you know, a bunch of other things that are shown here. Um, how our eyes sense that, so light is actually a spectrum. This, um, all lights are made up by a mixture of many different um, light rays that are different slices, different lines on the spectrum. So um, there'll be a mixture of light that'll happen to be um, a, a wave of one, one uh, wavelength and another wave, wavelength and another wavelength mixed together in certain proportions. Um, but that's not how our eyes actually see light. Um, we have these uh, light sensing elements. Um, human eyes have uh, photoreceptor cells of two different types, um, rods and cones. Mm -hmm. Rods are extremely sensitive to light, uh, but don't really distinguish between the different wavelengths. Cones are light sensitive. They're less light sensitive than, um, than the rods are but they have a much narrower band of sensitivity as far as the different wavelengths. Um, and there are three different types of cones, um, long, medium, and short, based on the type of wavelengths that they're sensitive to. Um, those long, medium, short essentially correspond to R, G, and B. Um, digital cameras um, do this a, a little bit differently. Um, both film and digital cameras try to, to emulate the sort of process that the human eye uses um, because it's trying to reproduce images that appear you know, similar and natural to what our eyes will end up seeing after we see the result of that image. Um, digital cameras have grids of photosensors um, with a color filter over, over them, a color filter array. Uh, this is because the sensors themselves don't aren't wavelength specific at all. They just detect where their photons hit it at all. Um, so to, m to distinguish between red, green, and blue, they have a, a color filter of each different type over them. They're, they're laid out typically in the, in the pattern that's shown here, which is called uh, a Bayer pattern, which has two green elements for every red and blue because our eyes are more sensitive to green than they are to red and blue. Um, film does this in a a uh, very different way than those two, th um, than the human eye or digital cameras. Instead of um, having a, a specific point on the surface that corresponds to one of those individual wavelengths, um, the, the red, green, and blue is separated by layers. Um, black and white film senses light um, based on a layer of silver halide uh, crystals that are in a, uh, a gel gelatin emulsion layer. Um, those crystals end up reacting to light and causing a, a chemical change in the film that after it's developed ends up turning into light and dark areas on the film. Um, but that's only for a single layer and that's only gonna detect just whether light hit it or not um, for black and white film. To make color film actually work, which took a very long time for people to engineer. Um, it has multiple layers of uh, per color. So there'll be a blue layer, a green layer, a red layer. In fact, in, in modern film, there's like 13 different layers of, of, of different things there. But um, those things still correspond to, uh, there's still layers in there that correspond to 
uh, red, green, and blue. The important part here, though, is that um, light has to pass through each one of those layers and ends up hitting the other one. So there can be some mixing between the different layers, which is called crosstalk. Um, but anyways, this, these are how light is sensed by all these different, these different types of things. Mm -hmm. um, these are spectral sensitivity charts. They describe the different wavelengths, um, how, what wavelengths are detected by each one of those different types of sensors. So on the left, we have the human eye with the small, medium, and long, uh, or the short, medium, and long um, different cone receptor cells, which are corresponding to the, the blue, green, and red um, elements in, in the eye. On the right, we've got um, the, the red, green, and blue uh, sensitivity for a Nikon uh, D700 camera, digital camera. You'll see they they look pretty similar to one another. Um, it's uh, it's the red and green channels though are rather different in the between yeah the two. kind of they end up matching up to slightly different places on on the wavelength curve for where their their peak lines up. So, mm -hmm. but not that much off. You'll see like the the peak for red still lines up with roughly 600, and the peak for green is like somewhere in the five. 25 to 550 range, it, but for the most part, it's, it's <coughs> pretty similar. Um, it's important to note, though, that um, there is some crossover. So you can see, like the um, the tails of those curves um, still overlap. So like the the tail of the the red and green curve ends up overlapping with where the peak of the blue curve is. So if you get really bright blue light. Um, it'll end up registering a very small amount with both green and red. Um, so if you get very bright colors in either one of these different primaries, um, they'll end up registering some amount in the others. And that, that small amount of, of uh, registering ends up desaturating your colors when you get really bright colors. Mm. So in computer graphics, we can't afford to simulate light spectrally as different wavelengths. Um, Doing that is called spectral rendering, um, but it is hardly ever used in practice, even for um, the CG in offline generated stuff in films. There is a few renderers out there that support this in the offline space. Um, nobody in real-time graphics does this, and hardly anyone in film even does this. Um, it's just too expensive, and for the most part, not e important, um, because RGB works pretty well. Um, instead, we, we use this, um, these three different color channels um, as a reasonable approximation to what the eye sees in the end, because our, our photo detectors are, end up seeing just these three different wavelengths anyways. We can simulate the light as if it was just made up of these three different wavelengths instead of that entire spectrum. Um, that approximation can result in some differences from reality, but is pretty accurate in practice. Um, but we need to figure out, so we, we've decided that we should do red, green, and blue. But we need to figure out what does the red, green, and blue mean? Like, what, are, what green are we going to choose, for example? What does 0, 1, 0 as our green color, what does that equal as far as the light spectrum? Um, the, this choice um, for which, which one of those um, RGB values mean um, are called the RGB primaries. So th this is a diagram of the spectral locus and all of the, the colors that the human eyes can see are within this shape. The spectral locus is the curve going around the top um, and that is essentially the visible light spectrum from um, about 400 to 700 wrapped around this curve, and all of the colors in in between inside this shape are mixtures of all of the all of the curves around, or all of the colors around the perimeter. Um, so you can see white there is in the center, and all of the other colors that we can see are mixtures of all of that with different percentages of of each one of those combined together. Um, this triangle. Are the points on this triangle represent the the sRGB and Rec 709 primaries? Um, 
sRGB and Rec. 709 are color spaces used in desktop monitors and TVs. Uh, they use the same primaries between sRGB and Rec. 709, so I'll, I just have one diagram here to show both of them. Um, they were chosen due to being reproducible by displays at the time. Um, gamut, the, the term gamut, is means the amount, the area inside that triangle. Um, this, that area inside the triangle describes all of the colors that can be represented by a mixture of those primaries. Anything outside of that triangle would be outside of the gamut and would not be representable in sRGB colors. Um, the, the larger that triangle is, the more area that is inside the triangle um, would be considered um, how wide the gamut is, is how big that triangle is. Mm -hmm. um, so you may have heard the term before, wider gamut colors, that's what that means. Um, you can also notice that the sRGB primaries are not on the spectral locus themselves, um, which means that there's, there's colors outside of that triangle that are not representable by sRGB monitors, are not representable by um, games right now because we, we render out for these, these um, standard monitors and TVs. <laughs> which is uh, which is kind of what we have here. And, yeah, and before so the stream, they were complaining. It's like, nothing's going to render quite right on here. So you guys at home might have to remember to make adjustments to your monitors, but um, you're never going to have quite right. Yeah, you're never so going to be able to hit these spectrums, though. Yeah, well, that's so... That's a little bit different than what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you're, you're bringing up uh, having a calibrated display, uh. which is important to be able to see colors properly. Um, your average display won't doesn't come out of the box calibrated, unfortunately. It would save us a whole lot of hassle. Um, <laughs> what that essentially means is that every, every one of your displays or TVs at home will end up displaying the same image slightly differently. Um, this comes down to competition between manufacturers and which TVs end up look, looking best on Best Buy walls and a <laughs> bunch of nonsense that has nothing to do with actual uh, real color representation or color theory, unfortunately. Um, all of them can be calibrated using some special hardware and software to do the calibration. That's the sort of thing that we do internally um, with whenever we're doing serious art color work. We have all of our, our displays calibrated. If you go to a high quality theater, um, their theater projectors will be well calibrated. Unfortunately, the ones that you buy off the shelf um, won't be calibrated well. Um, but even the ones that are, if they are sRGB space, pre pretty much all of the consumer model displays out there right now um, are really representing colors in this sort of space. They don't go much outside of it. In the future, um, there is a color space called um, Rec 2020, which is just been adopted by um, the Ultra HD standard, so eventually we'll have displays that'll be able to cover most of these colors, um, but not quite there yet. Uh, let's see, what was I going to say next? Um, up until recently, RGB renders both both offline and for for film and for real-time games have used these primaries for a bunch of of reasons that aren't super interesting to get get into here, but the most obvious reason of why to use these primaries for rendering mm -hmm. instead of just display is because that is what you end up outputting to for your display. So it makes sort of common sense to be using that for um, for your rendering as well. So why why do any sort of simulation of colors that are outside of the space that you can end up displaying in the end? Um, it turns out, though, that that's not the best thing that you can do. Um, you can get a much more accurate treatment of color um, if you do calculations in a wider gamut and then, dis then transform to your color space and the end when you're about to output to the display to whatever the display's color space is, which commonly nowadays is, is still going to be sRGB, um, but in the future maybe the Rec 2020. So. What's a, what's a wider gamut, or what is the good primaries to do your rendering in? Um, experiments have shown that primaries that are very close to these um, will get you the closest match to what spectral renderers would do. Um, so if you were to try to accurately simulate all the different 
um, wavelengths individually uh, and do a render that way, which is very expensive, takes a long time. Um, this will get closest to that, uh, which is also means that it gets closest to what the real world does mm. as far as color and how cameras and film would capture this and all that stuff would would match how the real world works. These primaries are the ASUS CG primaries. Um, you'll notice that they're very close to the spectral locus, which makes some amount of kind of common sense that doing simulation with um, with wavelengths that are essentially just pure wavelengths ends up making um, the most accurate results. Um, but that's just my own intuition on it. Um, I don't actually know why this works the best, but experiments have, many different people in many published papers have done experiments in this direction and have kind of come to the same conclusion. Um, that doing wider gamut and specifically these primaries will give you the most accurate match to spectral renders. Um, now, quick question on mm -hmm. those last graphs. Actually, uh, Setokun and chat was asking, uh, how is a negative one value for blue and ACES gamut treated in UE4? Um, we don't work with, with negative values. Mm -hmm. um, they cause problems. We end up just like clamping them out. Okay. Um, there's some, some uh, texture formats, render target formats, that just don't support negatives at all. So we typically clamp them out. Some of them do, some don't. It depends what you have, so for what you end up sake, using. Clamp. Yeah, so we end up clamping them out. Um, going back to this diagram, as far as just representing the colors themselves, if you're not doing any um, math operations on them, multiplying them, raising to them up to a power, stuff like that, it's fine to have um, colors that would be outside of this range, you would end up having a negative value for one of your color channels to specify something that's outside of gamut. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is once you start doing multiplications, so you say, I want to multiply my light color times my diffuse color, mm. um, it no longer works. Um, you really oh. have to have things in the right color space to be doing any nonlinear operations. If all you're doing is adding colors up, um, it's fine to have negatives. It's fine to actually have things, the color space doesn't matter when you're adding colors, but when you're multiplying, when you're raising them to an exponent, um, you need to have them in the right color space, or otherwise yeah. you'll get different results. That makes perfect sense then, I guess. Um, so I was mentioning this ASUS CG. So what is ASUS? Um, this has got a, a bit of popularity around the game industry very recently. Um, we've been using it, as, as I was mentioning, for about two years now. Um, we've gotten some, some great results with it that have, have come to this, uh, this filmic tone mapper, but what is it? Um, it is ASUS stands for the Academy Color Encoding System. This was created by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences as a collaboration of a bunch of different um, people in the in the film industry to uh, a lot of very smart color scientists and experts in how film work um, ended up contributing to this this standard. Um, it's now been used. Uh, it's been out for a little while now. It's, it's been used in a number of very big films. Um, you can check IMDb for a big list of all the different films this has gone into. Um, probably all your favorite films for the past couple years have are likely to have used it. Um, it includes this this new color space that I was mentioning before, ASUS CG, as well as a ton of other stuff. Um, the primary thing that ASUS provides um, the world in general is a standardized film response um, so that VFX companies can all work in the same sort of space when they interchange um, their renders and their assets between different companies. Uh, typically for any modern film, there won't just be one VFX company, there'll be a number of different companies. Um, um, some will be doing VFX, some will do the, the color grading, you've got colorists involved, there'll be multiple VFX companies doing that. Um, you just look at the credit list on any modern movie, you see tons of different people involved. Being able to exchange things between them um, was what this was primarily meant to solve. That's not as important to us um, in mm -hmm. the game industry. There are some of our, our film industry customers which can benefit from us matching the standard. Uh, but for everyone else, 
Um, the, mot the motivation primarily for us is to piggyback on all this great work by the Academy and benefit from, from the experts that they had involved in film and color science to learn best how to simulate the, the look of film. Um, this isn't just for some sort of like skeuomorphism. Uh, the film is industry has been far more serious about color science than I think anyone in the film or in the game industry ever has. Uh, what we were talking about before about calibrated displays and projectors and things like that is, for the most part, game companies hadn't even calibrated their monitors up until the last couple of years. Um, we've been making game and art content on just whatever our displays happen to be set up as. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the film dangerous. industry has been taking that stuff very, very yeah. seriously for decades now um, and not just doing the simple thing of calibrating their, their displays, um, but doing much more serious work and you know they they have professionals whose sole job it is is to understand how color works um and to make sure that the color that that was um intended by by the director and the colorist and everybody involved um is is reproduced accurately um and that they've everything is handled and treated in the correct way. Um, so it's useful for us to learn from, from these experts in the industry. Um, you can also say not just um, as far as in CG, but also um, film and camera manufacturers for, for decades have lived and died uh, based on being able to produce the most beautiful images. So the, the way in, in which film works isn't just a byproduct of of the technology involved to, to make it work at all, it's also highly tuned to make um, as, as pretty a picture as they possibly could, um, or otherwise someone else would have beaten them to market. So it's worth learning a bit about what goes into, into this stuff. Um, so what is tone mapping, as that is kind of the, the topic that uh, I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we had to we had to give it some background. It's <laughs> yeah. important, you know. Um, so all of our lessons. all of our rendering internally is in high dynamic range. This means that the things on screen can be brighter than your display can reproduce. Uh, the technical term of tone mapping refers to mapping these HDR colors to the range that a display can output. That's it. It has nothing specifically to do with with film or. Um, getting the, the look of colors is really about just you have bright things, your display can't go that bright. How do you display that thing on a, on a dis how do you output that to a display that can't go as bright as what the content um, actually is? So there's two kind of broad different ways of doing this, one of which is called uh, uh, local tone mapping. This means that it applies different rules to different, different regions of the image. Um, so our eyes and the visual cortex do like a very complex form of this, uh, which means we can see quite a bit more range in a single scene than any camera typically has, t typically can. Um, HDR photography, if you've seen any of that, um, is, is essentially local tone mapping. Uh, the other type is global tone mapping, which in photography and games is, is a lot more what, y what you'd expect, which is apply the same rules to all of the pixels. So our cameras, um, any camera that you really work with, and games um, use global tone mapping. Here's an example of what local tone mapping looks like. Um, so on the left, we have a single exposure for this photo. Um, on the right, many different exp um, photos of different exposures were taken and then combined um, using a local tone mapper so that you can see that some of the, the dark areas in the, the other image um, are now visible without blowing out the completely bright areas. Um, this typically loses quite a bit of contrast though. Um, and to be clear, we don't do that. Yeah, this, this is not like what we do. This is just no. covering the, the, the overall topic of what does tone mapping mean. Yep. This is one type of tone mapping. Um, but it's very expensive to do. Doing this processing um, is not really real-time friendly, um, and it also has problems um, with, with contrast and saturation, mm -hmm. as well as it's typically difficult to do totally automatically. So this, like this, this um, example here, had to be very artistically tuned to make it look like this. 
Um, having it go through an automatic algorithm can make some images look good and other images look really bad. Um, having that be automatic and very kind of heavy is a very difficult problem to do. Um, there are some cameras, as, cameras like your um, the current gen of iPhones, for example, have an HDR mode in their camera, but they're typically much more of a light touch than what this is doing. So global tone mapping, this is what we're kind of more familiar with with photography, as well as what all games do, um, or at least up until now what all games do. Um, this means that a single exposure value is used for the entire frame. The exposure is either chosen automatically based on some auto exposure algorithm to try to figure out what exposure um, algorithmically looks best, or it's artist specified where the artist says, here, I want to stop this up or stop it down. Um, this means that there is also highlight compression. So on a per pixel um, basis, it compresses when uh, bright colors are much above with the range of the display. Um, all of this, the as far as global tone mapping, we had before with our old tone mapper. Um, all of this we still have with the new tone mapper. The difference is the sort of filmic response. So th this curve here um, is, is called a S-curve or S-shaped. Um, it reason being, it kind of looks like an S. <laughs> um, Pretty much all film has a curve like this. All film has an S-shaped curve. The reason why is that it just looks better. Um, so here is a, a, a Kodak um, example image, um, test image called Marcy. Um, this is what Marcy looked like in, with no tone mapper at all. This will this has clipped highlights you can see in her hair where it starts going yeah, uh, these totally like na nasty <coughs> um, yeah. sort of yellowish values before it goes white and then when it goes white it's just completely clipped. Um, it overall just kind of looks very low contrasty and just kind of just sort of like flashed and milky. Yeah, in addition, all the dark values are very gray. Yeah, yeah. The, just overall it just looks very gray and hazy. Uh, this is what our old tone mapper did. So you can see the, the highlights in her hair still look pretty similar. I'll go back and forth between them. The old tone mapper made it a little more contrast, but didn't do a whole lot. Um, this mm -hmm. is what the new tone mapper looks like. You'll see all the highlights in her hair don't look so like weirdly nasty yellow. Mm -hmm. um, they have this nicer, this nicer roll off in the, the intensities. The overall, the contrast, um, looks much more appealing. The the blacks aren't all kind of like milky and and hazy. Um, they have that sort of like um, sort of richer, deeper darks. Overall, it's just a better looking image. Um, now compare this to film. Here is what Marcy looks like on Kodak film. I mentioned before that this image came from Kodak's test library. They include both what the, the HDR values are as well as what the final film on Kodak in their original test suite should look like. And yes, you can see that our new tone mapper comes pretty close to the look of Kodak film. Now each each different type of film will have a slightly different look, so the goal here isn't to exactly match it. Um, this would be exactly matching what this particular Kodak film stock looks like. Um, but the point that we're getting at here is that it just looks generally more like the, l the look of film, and in general just also just plain looks better. Uh, so that's that's all the slides I've got here, but I have some other um, bunch of other example images. That's not what I wanted. Hmm. So I've got some test scenes with. Um, here's a bunch of sphere spheres with different colored balls on them with different exposure levels. Uh, this is using the old tone mapper. And as we, we stop up the exposure, um, you can see that there's no longer gradients on these spheres anymore. They just kind of clamp off to these, these primary colors. And they start looking just really unnatural. You can't tell that these spheres are really bright. They're, you can't tell that they're, they're really high exposure value. Um, they just kind of look like their primary colors, and they lose all sort of shading and shape. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that is not the image I want to go to. Um, here is what the same scene looks like um, with the new tone mapper. So we start off at the base. We've got essentially the same look. But as we increase the exposure, you can see that that these colors continue to have shape to them. They still have these sort of shading gradients over them. They look like they're they're appearing to get brighter and brighter. Um, the way that this does that is by de by desaturating the highlights, um, so that instead of it just going to solid green, it starts going brighter and brighter by going more and more white. Mm. Um, now this seems like it's an odd artistic choice, um, or that it might be arbitrary. But this is, in fact, what what cameras do. So, and just had this quick idea right before we started this stream of why don't I use my SLR, my Canon SLR camera, and shoot just what the scene looks like with linear HDR values off of my monitor at a bunch of different exposures and see what the Canon um, camera looks like. And it ends up doing this exact same thing to what our tone mapper is. So I don't have the exact same... It wasn't like a really well-controlled test, so I didn't <laughs> have the same color balance between all these. So you have to take this for a, l a little bit of being sloppy. But anyways, you can see the general idea here, which is af as I stop up the exposure, you can see that the, the bright areas get go totally white, and that you can continue to see mm. um, that there's this sort of gradient that's still there in the shading yep. um, while these, these primary colors are still there when it gets darker. Um, ends up kind of resembling the same, the same sort of look that Filmic Tone Mapper. Um, just taking some, uh, that's not what I wanted. Taking some other um, random images from the web that I grabbed um, some other examples of really bright um, but saturated colors and what they look like and cameras. So these are tail lights for cars. You can do your Google image search for tail lights on cars. They'll all look like this, essentially. Um, here are uh, police um, lights, where you can see that the bloom is clearly of very saturated blue or red values, um, or otherwise you wouldn't get that sort of blooming. But you can see the core of that light source is going white. Here's Christmas lights, which are doing the same sort of thing. The core of the the light goes white, um, or overall, once it gets further away and lower in intensity, it stays saturated. And of course, lightsabers. Um, would lightsabers look nearly as good as if they're if the just core of it was like solid red or solid green? It just wouldn't look nearly as bright uh, as what that looks like. And Lastly, we've got an example here that kind of shows both the same light at different intensity levels because the, the reflection of these lights will be dimmer. So you can see that the reflection of these blue lights is still totally blue and green, but as it gets brighter, it starts to desaturate. Um, one last thing I thought I'd show is, so that, that S curve that I showed before, the one that, this one is, is matching um, what the ASUS curve, um, this is part of the, the standard, includes this film response curve. Um, this is one area that we've deviated from ASUS. Um, in the ASUS standard, there is just this, this fixed curve. Um, we've, we match that curve by default. The default values um, for the tone mapper are completely, like, very accurately match this curve. But we have controls to change it away from that, which is a way of kind of simulating different types of film stock. So we've got uh, a slope control, which kind of changes the, the overall kind of slope of this line. Uh, we have a toe control, which changes how curved the toe part of that curve is, the toe of that S curve. Um, we have a shoulder, which controls how how round the shoulder shoulder of that curve is, um, and we've got black and white clip points. You typically never change the black clip point; you just leave that at zero. Um, but changing the white clip point changes where that crossover is for where whites start clipping. Um, but this means that we we can end up um, simulating a bunch of different film stocks instead of necessarily just matching whatever the ASUS 
standardized film stock is supposed to look like. Um, but anyways, that's that's kind of my explanation of, of Tone Mapper. Uh, yeah. I'll hand it over Sweet. to Jordan to show some of this like in practice. Yep, um, sure. Fortunately, we were, we were planning on showing some stuff in Paragon, but had some last minute technical difficulties. Yeah, so I, I apologize <laughs> for that one. The, the stream machine decided it did not like that particular build. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, we have, uh, oh, so you already have it up on screen. So yes, we have uh, the realistic rendering um, room that we're going to be messing around in. Uh, and you've got uh, the new filmic updates put into this. Yeah, so it's turned on in this scene now. Um, and I guess I'll start off, like, we'll talk about, like, Tone Mapper uh, for a little bit. And then I'll also go over the new color grading controls we added. Because you'll find that, like, you know, we changed the Tone Mapper but to get artistic control, you probably shouldn't mess a whole lot with the tone mapper and instead should rely on color grading. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the, the intention there is that if you want to change kind of what, what your film stock is that you'd be, say, shooting a whole film with or shooting many scenes of a film with, um, or if they're just general look for your studio is a certain type of thing because you want to use this, that's kind of what... Actually, we should probably change the name of that from Tone Mapper to like Film Stock or something like that <laughs> to, to better explain what that sure. intention yeah. is. But anyways, that's the intention of those sorts of controls. They're not intended to be changed dynamically um, or in like a shot-by-shot -shot basis yeah. or like you walk into some certain zone, you walk into a cave and now you have different Tone Mapper controls. Really, that's meant to be like, okay, narrow in on what you want your Film Stock to look like and then all of the like shot-specific um, or area-specific places in your game um, to control the artistic look of that, the intention is to use the color grading tools. Yeah, I, I would say like for your game, maybe pick a tone mapper look, stick with it. Yeah. Uh, but just real quickly, it's like, you know, like Brian was talking about, the slope will sort of control that sort of contrast feel in there where the lower the slope value, the more it flattens out and the grayer the scene will get. Um, the toe is that sort of bottom in, and you can really crush your blacks that way so you know be careful and then there's that shoulder which you really only start to see as things start to get bright here yeah shoulder is really just about how how much you're going to compress your highlights down yeah. instead of having them clip but it's usually it's a pretty pretty subtle thing black clip you know it, it pulls all your colors down into absolute black i I don't know that I've ever actually pulled it. Yeah, I, I would recommend <laughs> not touching that. It's not really a look thing. It was really just a symmetrical thing in the curve. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then white clip, obviously, will start to clip out your whites right here. Um, there's been an occasion where I maybe have like tweaked that a bit just to punch the highlights a bit in a given scene or in, you know, for Paragon or whatever. But uh, it's pretty subtle. Yeah, and um, in most cases, th do we even change the those values anymore? I know we z we did a little bit early on, but mostly we're just doing it with grading now. Yeah, in in Paragon, I think we pretty much roll with default tone mapper, and then everything else comes through grading. Especially since we have a lot more granular control over the color grading now. Um, and so I guess I'll start talking about color grading, and in the sense of like. Uh, when we start a scene, you know, probably the first thing that we'll do is uh, uh, figure out our temperature of the white balance. You know, obviously, like a lower temperature uh, will push your scene cooler, and a higher temperature will push it warmer. But it also depends on the temperature that you're assigning to your lights in the scene. And so, if your post process temperature matches the temperature of your lights, you'll end up with white. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the same control of uh, your white balance temp in a camera. So if, if you've got any people with photography experience, this will be the temperature of your, your white balance uh, setting on your camera. The temperature that you'd specify in the light would be the actual, like, what is the, the temperature of the light that it's emitting. And if so those things match, they, they'll cancel each other out. The temperature white. usually tends to go from like cool to warm, and then there's tint that goes from green to magenta. Mm -hmm. Don't find myself adjusting tint a whole lot. I think, you know, it's, kind of parody with photography and you tend to, to encounter that more with fluorescent lighting um, but it's not really something that shows up when lighting our environments in our games uh, and so I guess to give a bit of a mindset like we kind of have all of these controls now between like shadows midtones and highlights 
mm -hmm. uh, and they're all replicated inside of global. And so when I look at a scene, you know, I'll, I'll tend to do a global pass on the look and sort of establish like, you know, what's my saturation level for the scene? Uh, uh, how much contrast do I want to bring into here? And uh, <coughs> now that we've done a pass on this, we have this, we have the three numbers that re represent the three color channels and then this W that's kind of like a scalar on it. And so, you know, you could adjust the contrast of just the reds um, or you could adjust this like global value. But what we found was when we just had these numeric values for colors, uh, it wasn't so much artist friendly. I think you, as an artist, you tend to start pushing yourself towards one color and you want to say like, let me just pull this a little bit more towards blue. And so that's why we started adding this color wheel. And so you can see in here, as I start to say, let me push some contrast so that my, you know, my highlights turn a little bit yellow and my, my shadows turn blue. You know, you can start to kind of pull that around the color wheel to find a look that you're going for. Um, and contrast is one of those that like, depending upon like how stylized your game is, you know, you may want to do just like a subtle push where your highlights go orange and your shadows go blue, or, you know, you may keep it completely uh, neutral and just adjust this, you know, overall contrast heaviness. Um, there's also gamma, which we probably, and Paragon, I would say we touch gamma before we touch contrast just because contrast will have a tendency to push both your highlights and your shadows. Whereas gamma, it's more like, this scene just feels too heavy. Like there's just too many dark values in this scene. And so we'll, we'll you know, de-gamma it a bit where we sort of lift this gamma value just to bring the heaviness out of the scene. Or conversely, if we want something to feel like the colors are more intense and, you know, we'll add a bit of gamma back in. Yeah. It, they that makes sense because those controls are very similar to one another. Mm -hmm. um, they're both essentially a gamma operation. It's just contrast is has a gamma that's centered around 18%. Mm. So it makes it so that 18% doesn't move. Yeah. Um, the gamma control is centered around zero. So yeah. so the blacks don't change, but 18% mm -hmm. does change. Yep. But they do is similar things. And then, you know, obviously gains just kind of like, I mean, is it a multiplier? It's essentially mm -hmm. you're, you're mm -hmm. just cranking the brightness on the scene or not. And it's, it's, and it's a quick way to say like, you know, once you, whereas contrast, when you're pulling the color around, you're kind of like shifting these colors on, on like sort of two axes where like you're going yellow in one direction and blue in another. But with gain, when you start pulling the colors around, it's, it's pretty much like, yeah, make my scene orange or make it green. Uh, yeah, if if you don't change the individual color channels for gain, it'll be similar to an exposure change. But I'd recommend not going too crazy. Like, don't try to do your exposure through gain. Right, right. <laughs> You'd be better off doing it with exposure. But gain is more sort of the, the sort of fine tweaks, especially if you're going to do it with different colors or to just the mid tones and highlights or mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, offset can be kind of tricky because you think about offset and it's like you know, gain will keep your zero, because it's multiplicative, right? It'll keep your black point at black and then just kind of like tilt everything upwards. You know, if you think about the graph of your colors, but mm. offset takes everything and it's additive, right? So mm. it's taking even your black point and just moving thing up and moving everything up. And so it's useful in the situation where uh, you want to pull out pure black but the values that you'll end up using for offset are really minor. Like, even as I start to drag, a, point, a value of 0.016 is still, you know, it's, it's already flashing my, my scene out here. And so, you know, 0.001, it, the video compression on the stream may lose it, but like 0.001 can, can just help, you know, sort of lift some of these dark levels up. And even in here, you can start to, if you do a color offset, you can get some really interesting looks. I just find that if I start, adjusting color on offset, I have to balance that by raising that that min value a bit. But you can get some really cool stylized effects by adjusting offset. Yeah, oh, wow. Usually with offset, it's, it's about sort of just doing a minor flash of your blacks because yeah. you want it to look a little bit more hazy or a little bit more bloomy than you're getting out of the image by default. Or if you've got a scene that looks too hazy because it's you've got fog in there and you want to 
remove the flashing of your blacks or reduce it, then you can have it be negative values and you could be subtracting color from your scene. Uh, you got to be careful though, as Jordan's saying, is to it keep can, it subtle. <laughs> it can get really gray. Uh, real quickly, scene color tint operates as it has before. You know, you're just essentially tinting the scene. Uh, and then there's like the color grading lookup table intensity, and then your color grading lookup table. So uh, yeah, it, it's w it's worth mentioning. So the the color grading that Jordan's talking about now is these are our new color ga grading controls. Um, this is done in a very different way than we supported color grading in the past. We used to have the, these LUTs that you'd you'd take an image, you'd you'd um, do a screenshot, have that stored out, you'd bring it into Photoshop, do a bunch of color changes in Photoshop bring that back into the engine as one of these these uh, LUTs um, and try to save all of those color manipulations that you did in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. um, the problem there is that all of this was happening in LDR. It was happening on the final color that was outputted to the monitor in sRGB space, um, which means it's kind of just a snapshot in time for what our display support is. Yeah. I mean, we've been... Which, yeah. which means that we can't... We can't take any of the work there as far as color grading that was done and have that work for an HDR TV that are now out. Or when I was mentioning a little bit ago about having wider gamut displays, all of that stuff doesn't apply. If you want to show this on a TV with Rec. 709 instead of sRGB, it doesn't apply anymore. Essentially, it was just it only worked for just what we supported at the time. All these new color grading controls, they all work in what's called scene referred linear space. So these are all on the HDR colors before they get tone mapped, uh, before they get transformed into whatever the display's color space is, which means these, these operations will work. It'll have the exact same look for no matter what sort of display you're outputting it to, whether it's an HDR TV, whether it's LDR, whether it's sRGB, Rec. 709, Rec. 2020, whatever, all, all that look will stay consistent. Yeah, and for that for that reason, we've moved away from lookup tables on Paragon. I think there's maybe one uh, ability or something that still uses a lookup table, and that may have even been removed recently. And we, we, we work strictly through these new color grading tools because we want to support you know HDR displays and not be limited to that format. Yeah, so we still um, keep the, the support for the LUTs are still there, it's still in there, but we're not using them and we recommend uh, moving forward that you, you move over to these new color grading controls. So the, remain the, re the remaining controls in these shadows, midtones, and highlights work the same way as the ones in global, but they only apply to, like if this is your full color range, you know, and shadows are down here, uh, uh, shadows will apply to like a user-defined range from black. And so while, you know, while we were saying, don't, you really shouldn't do gain to adjust your exposure in global because you should be using that uh, exposure and control to do that. When you're in shadows, midtones, and highlights, it can be really useful to sort of like adjust the gain in these sort of areas uh, independently of affecting your uh, like other ranges of color. And so um, this is where I'll find that like if my shadows in my scene are, you know, they, maybe they maybe my shadows need more contrast. Uh, I'll go into the contrast for the shadows and punch it. Or, you know, you can see as I start to remove it, it grays it out a bit. Um, but it gives you a lot of control over that area. And then what I'll find is, depending upon the scene and the how it looks, you know, in this shadow group, there's a value called shadow max. And this is basically telling it, uh, when I'm talking about shadows, like where is that cutoff point? And so you could push it really high so that it affects most of the scene, or you can, you know, pull it back down so that those adjustments are really only on, uh, like, just the dark areas of the scene. And then obviously, sort of like midtones, same thing. You know, it starts to get a bit repetitive because you're just doing the same controls. Uh, through every sort of scene, you know, through every sort of brightness level. Um, but like I said, like our mentality when we're grading something on, on Paragon or whatever is like, you know, you'll do a global pass for the scene and then sort of like dial in your highlights or dial in um, your shadows. Highlights can be interesting because that's where you can make the scene feel a little bit punchier. 
Um, you know, if I go into gain and just like punch up gain in the highlights, you can see, if you watch this area here where the lights hit, um, you can see where I can, like default is around here, right? And so if I want those highlights to just be a bit stronger, I can just push up the gain on there uh, and make that stuff feel really bright. You can also push it towards a color, make it feel a bit warmer, and maybe even like pull down into the midtones a bit. Uh, and it just helps, you know, sort of define these different looks for your scene. Um, but yeah, as far as grading, I'm pretty sure yeah, that pretty much covers it. I mean, a lot of it past this just gets into the nuance of like, you know, once you start setting up volumes, it's like we'll have a tendency to do one volume for the whole level. And then we'll do smaller volumes for different areas where you say like to pull in <coughs> different colors to give different moods, like if you're in the forest versus the exterior areas. But uh, this is like the general idea behind like grading with this new tone mapper and with these new controls inside of here. Awesome. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of questions all of a sudden on this. Actually, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you got them very interested. Uh, I, few people would like to to test out a couple things in the scene. Um, Lewis was just wondering if you can uh, invert shadow and light using this. I don't know. The look on your face says, if I try hard enough, maybe. Uh -huh. Do these values gain? Well, because we do clamp at negatives. I don't know yeah, if that will Gain doesn't go it. negative. Um, try contrast. Ah. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Nope. <laughs> the answer. You can, whoa, you can, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, you got something. There you go. You've I mean, got, it's negative one, but the values on screen are still. No, if, if you push it, yeah, push pull, it pull, more. Yeah, you're, kick you had it up it. a notch. There we go. That's well, inverted. That's. Uh, huh. This well, this now. Feels, this feels wrong. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, it does it, quite, it looks doesn't like it? like a negative. Yeah, it sure. Interesting. Does. So yeah, it's a, Well, it's not just inversion of light and dark. It's like full negative. Okay, so. Don't do it through the color. It seems like the color wheel <laughs> is actually clamping the, the values that I input. Um, but the these raw values up top, you can invert them. <laughs> Jeez. Right. Uh, huh. Well, there you go, guys. Uh, to answer that one, um, there you go. All right. So we have a few different questions here about a lot of different stuff. Um, now, we do have, uh, if you guys want to start with the forum questions that uh, we had I had shown you all before, um, uh, you guys want to start with the Lewis's one there? I, I, do we still have it brought up so we can just oh show the image that he has for his question? Um, yeah, there it is. Yeah, just drag that one. That no, not the whole thing, not the whole thing. Just oh the one tab. <laughs> <laughs> That's where all my secrets are kept. I don't want them knowing all my secrets. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this so looks yeah. like what Brian was yeah, talking Yeah, so about. I think we covered a lot of this already. All right. but It's, uh, it's that sense of like, you have these colors that are getting bright. Mm -hmm. uh, there's crosstalk, which essentially says as red gets brighter, it's going to start interfering with green and blue, which mm -hmm. starts to pull out the yeah. ratio of how much red there is. And so, um, yeah, we should be a little careful with the with the term crosstalk because it's a <laughs> it's a much more complicated phenomenon in film. As I was mentioning before, there's the multiple layers of film, so it's kind of like pass th light has to pass through some of the layers before getting to others. So there can be like some like just weird color changes or desaturation that'll be happening in an actual like physical film stock mm -hmm. um, that crosstalk is referring to. But but that's sort of just. Getting back to the sort of spectral response curve before where it's showing for each one of the color channels, there is this sort of tail that, that falls off that ends up overlapping with the other curves. And it'll happen both with film, with your eyes, with everything. Once you get bright enough colors, um, they will start to desaturate. All right. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, since uh, since we have Brian on, maybe he can talk a little bit about what he's working on at the moment and in the months <laughs> to come. Uh, it's always interesting to hear what's next in terms of rendering features and shaders. So what, what can we look um, forward to next? Let's see. What am I allowed to talk about is more of the bigger oh, question. I know, it's all the <laughs> secrets. Uh, um, I know. So let's say probably the safest stuff is, is the things that we did for the, the mill human race demo. That's actually what I've been working on over the past like w week and probably this next this week um, is getting bringing over some of that stuff that we we had going in that demo um, that should be getting in for the 416. Um, the one of the big things that I did there was uh, bent normal support. 
um, and reflection occlusion. Um, so, well, what are those exactly? Um, can so you talk about that? We, we can. Okay. I, I don't know if we want to turn that into a different. Oh, different yeah. I mean, thing. I just want to give like a brief summary overview so they understand what the feature. Br brief is. summary is uh, bent normals are um, a another bit of data that uh, matches up with AO, and it gives you so AO is the amount that um, light is amount of the the hemisphere from a point on the surface that's visible that isn't blocked by other geometry around it. If it's highly blocked, then the AO will be dark. If it's mostly visible, it'll, or if it's completely visible hemisphere, um, it'll be white. The bent normal describes the direction in which that is the average direction of visibility. So AO says how much is visible. Um, the bent normal says in which direction is it most visible. Mm -hmm. We can use that information for, for better um, indirect lighting yeah. combined with the AO. And then I got a kind of a, a nifty scheme of being able to use those two values to get some sense of reflection occlusion, um, which is a view dependent form um, of it. So you can see kind of, a, it's not super accurate. It's not as perfect as if you would ray trace, um, but it's an approximation of being able to see an object um, self-reflecting, so blocking itself. Um, it'll just be on a per-object basis, just like if you bake AO maps right now, you won't be getting the darkening from an object that's nearby it. You'd need to do like a light mass bake or something like that to get that. Um, but uh, this will be, because those AO maps, because they're just done for a single object, and then reused every time that object is used, you could typically have them be far, far higher resolution. So, you know, little cracks and stuff in the normal map, you'll be able to get that showing up in your AO and be able to get that to show up in there. Awesome. Reflection occlusion. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, that, so that's coming. We're uh, going to have to get you on and, and actually like show some examples <laughs> of that one. Yeah. 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 Um, well, what else? We've got some compositing stuff that was done for that demo that I don't think is going to, no, not going to make it in for 416. What is? Um, We've got some faster cube map filtering for skylights. Um, I, I don't remember all the, all the different stuff that we've got, but we're bringing That's stuff right. over that we did on that demo. All righty. Um, to 416. Cool. Um, cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, will Epic update current tech demos uh, like Elemental with the new tone mapper? Uh, do you guys know if we have any plans for, yeah, getting, I guess, uh, he says uh, current tech demos. Those are. Uh, that one's a little bit older now, too, um, but I wasn't sure if we are going to reach back so and make any updates be there. Because we've changed the default of the engine, <laughs> um, they just have been updated. Oh, <laughs> like, so it's... Yeah, I, and it I, opened, it. I opened this up this morning, mm -hmm. and it's using Filmic Tone Mapper, so... Oh, I thought that was really go. quick when you came in here, and <laughs> we opened like, it up, and you're like, great. yeah, it's all set up now. <laughs> like, oh, okay, that seemed easy. Yeah. There you go. It's, it's actually... So we've got... It's kind of, kind of funny, but we've got some... We're just starting to do uh, visual regression testing so that we can compare like screenshots that were captured before and then after a change and have just this automated system compare those screenshots and say, has this changed? Y yes, um, and then, then changed, it's, yeah. it raises a flag and say, something's changed. And then we determine, it's like, did we mean for it to change or was this a bug? Was it an accident? Yeah. Um, so it's like cha large scale changes like that where it's just like, Every single thing, it, like every one of those tests, just get you just see it all light up. Every <laughs> single one of them is like, Blah, something changed all the way across the board. <laughs> that, that must be pretty exciting to have. Yeah, to go well, it's, it's one of those things. Is like, oh, am I going to have to go through two hundred <laughs> different tests and vet them all? It's like, no, no, I, I changed something big. I'm not going to test every <laughs> one of them. Yeah, I know they changed. So, uh, so yeah, go in there and see what it looks like, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, does, oh, does Brian have a master's? Uh, a student was asking that. I do not. No, I've got a bachelor's in computer science. Yep. Um, the and that answers the other question. I was wondering if it was in computer science. Yeah, so. bachelor's in computer science. I went to UC Davis. Hmm. Um, the, the decision that I had at the time was um, what would be more th worthwhile for me to stay in school for a bit longer to try to get whatever those those two years or whatever it would take me um, with work experience. And I, I made the call of, I think it was going to be more worth it to have two years of work experience in the industry than having the, the master's. Um, same choice would be there if you're looking at a PhD. That that choice will be different for each person, but yeah. that's that's the direction that 
that I made. I kind of did the same thing where I was like uh, in the middle of the degree and I was like, you know what, work experience in the actual industry is probably going to end up converting into something better for myself. Yeah, but so I know some people that completed out everything and it worked out better for them to complete their degrees. Yeah, as, as far as just resume building, um, I, I would say once you have a bit of experience on your resume, no one cares at all. About what, what school what, you came yeah, from. Yeah, what school you <laughs> yeah. came from, what your GPA was, even what your degree was, um, yeah. in the game industry at least. There's yeah. other industries where if you have a PhD next to your name that will carry with you for your entire life and matter, uh, I don't think it matters in the game industry. But that's not to say that it's not worth anything because there's a bunch of stuff that you'll learn in that that you won't necessarily learn on the job. So it depends on what sort of areas you want to get into. Um, if you if you think that you'll you can use very advanced mathematics um, in your computer graphics work, if that's the sort of thing that you're you gravitate towards, um, getting some of those advanced mathematics classes in can be helpful. Um, that you might be touching in a master's or PhD. Ah. Um, but if o you overall. just want to code some games and make gameplay stuff or write your fastest Vulcan backend or something like that, um, it's probably not going to be that helpful. Yeah, you, you, there's a lot of uh, self-teaching out there. I, I've seen yeah. uh, between a lot of our artists and our developers, there's a lot of going out and just doing a hundred tutorials a hundred times until you've you as, as well can as talk you, you know you can confidence. always buy those textbooks. It's, yep. You can always learn later in life. Yep. Um, in fact, most of the classes I did were just, hey, open the textbook, go to this page, read it. It was basically the class that forced you to read. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, okay, a couple of people are asking this basic kind of concept, so I'm just going to um, throw it all together into one question. Um, how can we sort of create a reverted version of this? Like, if we don't want to use the new tone mapper and we want to kind of set the settings uh, back, how, so, how is the best way to get close to that? Well, uh, the closest thing at the moment is to just change the CVAR because the old code's still there. Um, mm -hmm. We don't plan to be supporting that forever. Yeah. And we don't have a plan right this second for... Um, when we plan to to deprecate the the old one, when we plan to remove it, I'm it, it won't be for 16, so it's not like a thing that's hanging over everyone's head. <laughs> if you, if you want to continue using it for a while, it'll probably still be there for a while. But I can say for pretty pretty certain that uh, five years from now, it will not be in the engine anymore, <laughs> <coughs> and probably it'll be removed much sooner than five years from now. Um, but there are controls in so in, in the in the post process settings in the the tone mapper controls. Um, I have come up with settings in there that match the old curve. Um, I do not know them off of the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! no. Um, <laughs> but I I've sent them to somebody. Let's see. Maybe we could. Post it or something. Yeah, if you guys I could definitely me, post it. Yeah, I, I, I can, would have I to dig up into my into my emails. Or uh, yeah. Yeah. it's it's in, it's in actually some of the shader code, like in the code that does this. I've got a comment in there of how to match the old tone mapper curve. Yeah, but um, the the CVAR is just R dot tone mapper film, and you can set that in a config to zero. Yeah, yeah if it's set to zero, then it's just completely disabled. Yeah, yeah. I I should be clear though that what I'm talking about with those settings are the settings that control this curve to make it a very close match for what the other curve was, which um, I just eyeballing it was yeah. much was much more like like this. Mm -hmm. It was very shallow was slope. More, gra more, gra more <laughs> gradual. Yeah, not, not, not very S-like where the current one is, is somewhere more mm -hmm. more like this. And uh, actually, um, as long as but the thing that that doesn't change mm -hmm. is what color space the tone mapping is done in. We now do the the uh, the tone mapping in that AC or the ASUS uh, CG color space, where previously we did that in the sRGB color space. So that part is not currently reproducible in the note in the new tone mapper. All right. Maybe we'll offer that option in the future to pick what color space, but there's no controls for that right now. All right. Um, and uh, actually, uh, since we're looking at this uh, curve editor now, a few people have asked, um, uh, Troxmo and Fresh Lemonade, we're both asking about, uh, can we get a, a color grading uh, 
preview curve or some kind of color grading curve graph where they can actually see like a curve in the engine to mess with. Is that something that you're uh, planning on or is this me making a feature request live on air? <laughs> we, we, we've discussed it before. Like oh, okay. when, when we talked about doing the, with the tools, so we had a dis long discussion with the tools team about the color grading tools that we have here. Mm -hmm. And we sort of had this like uh, stack rank list of like what, what the artists wanted, right? And, you know, first was, okay, I have these numbers I'm tweaking, I need a color wheel. And on that list was, you know, at some point it would be nice for us to see like a histogram and to see, you know, sort of how each co color channel is being distributed. And so certainly from the artist standpoint and what we've talked about with the tools team is um, that stuff would be nice. And it's, it's something that, you know, may come, but yeah. you know, it's all priority, right? Yeah, so um, that would be, we have talked about histograms, we haven't talked about curves before. Yeah. Um, really, the probably the curve that you, matter, you care more about would be if you're trying to change that tone mapping curve. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a bug right now, because I probably should, I haven't ever gotten around to implementing it. In Visualize HDR Adaptation, this is meant to show what that curve looks like. <laughs> um, it is currently broken, not showing the new film curve. Um, but this does show you kind of a histogram of the scene. It doesn't show you what that histogram looks like and, and um, with any color grading or anything like that in there. But if you wanted to see what the tone mapping curve is, when I get around to fixing this bug, it'll show this, this curve here will end up matching what my little graph is graph curve sh looks like and keep in mind I mean, that it'll, it'll be like wait flattened out but <laughs> it'll be like keep in mind the, like his, this, the histogram <laughs> is an hdr histogram so this histogram is showing a distribution of color that's not representative of what the final image is this is the color in the scene before it goes to the tone mapper so which is why this is actually pretty useful so that you can see how bright is the brightest thing in my scene that i'm is getting you know pushed a you yeah, know, co commonly when we're showing like HDR colors as well as this curve for that matter. This is in log space. Um, the reason that we use log space is that your your eyes sense things in, in a log curve. So it takes um, exposure stops when you say to stop something up or it was two stops of overexposed or something like that. A stop is one stop equals twice as bright. Um, two stops equals four times as bright, eight times as bright, so on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it follows that sort of log curve. Um, it's all your kind of senses typically work in that sort of fashion, like decibels, for example. Uh, uh, your, your ability to sense how loud sounds are follows a log curve as well. It's just oh. kind of a... Cool. Um, well, uh, let's see here. We're getting a little bit tight on time, uh, and uh, we're going to, I think we're going to throw out one more question here. Uh, it seems to be a few people asking about this, so I'll try to wrap it into one big question, um, and then uh, we'll call it a day. But uh, people are wondering, with this new filmic tone mapper, what are some good settings for virtual reality or stereo rendering? Is this going to affect virtual reality and stereo rendering? And um, generally, anything about virtual reality and filmic tone mapper, how are they going to interact with each other? Um, so... There's nothing special in regards to stereo. These are just how colors are dealt with. If there's two eyes or one eye or 12 eyes, it mm -hmm. uh, doesn't make much of a difference. Um, as far as VR, that's a good question. Um, Asus has standard outputs for a number of different types of viewing environments. Um, that inclu includes both um, desktop reference monitors that you'd be between colors at your desk, um, theater environments where you have, you're in total black um, and it's uh, projected on a screen. They've got it for HDR displays going all the way up to really bright, um, as well as different color spaces, but they do not have one for VR. Um, that's a case where you've got completely black surround and the display has been shown very large in your in your visual field. So it may be that uh, you need to do different things there. Um, All right. So <laughs> um, I, I would recommend just picking values that look good to you. Um, that, that's sure kind of what's nice about having this this tone mapping curve be adjustable compared to the ASUS standard where it's it's just a fixed curve. And I could say like 
from a content perspective, I can imagine adjusting VR differently than on a display. And I'm sure the Robo Recall guys can probably speak to what they found worked for their game. Because yeah, I'm sure like levels of contrast and stuff mm -hmm. are, yeah. will probably be more. Yeah, I'm gu I'm guessing they pleasing. went for a for a shallower curve than yeah. what it has by default, but it would be best to ask yeah. them. Yeah. I'm not sure what what settings they chose. Probably gonna have to do that when we've done one for the Robo Recall mod editor for how the sequencer stuff was yeah. done in it. But no, we haven't done one for just pure on like rendering and optimization and how all, like how you know settings were chosen and all that. Oh, for Robo Recall for optimization, Robo -Recall. that would be a great yeah stream. actually. <laughs> they're just saying those words like ooh Robo Recall optimization stream would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up for now since uh, we're getting a little bit tight on time, like I said. Um, but, uh, you know, Brian, Jordan, thank you guys so much for coming out. It was really informative. I feel like I uh, took a master class uh, today. Actually, it was incredibly, uh, incredibly informative. Um, but yeah, thank you all at home for coming out as well. And uh, remember to hit like, follow, subscribe, all those other social media based buttons that are all around whatever you're watching us on. If you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitch, if you're on YouTube, because uh, those are important to us. And that way also we can give you updates as new Unreal Engine content is coming out. And um, that's all that we've got for you today. Um, thank you so much and we'll see you around next Tuesday. Bye.